And so you've got two cultures going on, the parents' home culture and the culture of their you know, adopted country, but then the combination of these two. Welcome to David Sneed Ukraine Missions, a Calvary Temple podcast based out of Lviv, Ukraine. Hey everyone, this is David Sneed. I'm a missionary in Lviv, Ukraine, and today we are talking with George and Sharon Markey. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Great. It's great to hear. Um, so you guys are actually the third interview that I've had with the Markey clan. Um, and you guys are missionaries in Kiev, right? So how long have you guys lived in Ukraine? That's correct. Um, well, I've lived in Ukraine since 1982. So that's coming up on three years soon. And 28 years. Oh, well, 28 years, yeah. And then Sharon mm-hmm. has been here. 17 years. 17 years. Yeah. I mean, have you guys lived in any other countries aside from the United States? I haven't. I lived in France. Yeah, well, that's cool. How long did you live there? And uh, I'm assuming you speak a little bit of French, right? I do. Um, French is actually my second language. I'm more fluent in French than in Ukrainian. Oh, wow. Um, I lived in France for a school year. So I was there eight months. I was working as an English language um, assistant in a French public high school. Mm. Very cool. Very cool. Just for anybody that's watching, if you want to get more acquainted with the rest of the Markeys, uh, feel free to check out my other interviews, one with John Markey and one with David Markey. Uh, I'll have links to those in the description. So today I want to talk about parenting on the mission field. That's a request that actually uh, came in from one of my viewers, one of our listeners. Uh, So first of all, how many kids do you guys have? We have six. All boys. All boys, six boys. All righty. So five more and you'll have a football team, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So t- tell us about your boys. Well, the oldest one is 13 and he loves to read and he's very studious. And then we have all the way down kind of every two years with some bigger gaps until our two-year-old who is uh, just turned two and he's very happy. He smiles and laughs all the time. And we've got a, uh, our second child is uh, very mechanically engineering minded. Our third child actually just broke his femur a little, oh, wow. a little under two weeks ago and was in the hospital for a while and he's recuperating now. Goodness. Our second broken bone. Yeah. Boys. In all these years, we're kind of lucky. And uh, then we've got a, a uh, I'm gonna say first grade, but just graduated from first grade. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then a, oh boy, there he is. Peter wants me, I need to go help the one with the broken leg. So George can take over for a minute. Okay. All right. Well, uh, while we're waiting for Sharon to get back, uh, are there any good books that maybe you guys could recommend for third culture parenting? Uh, you know, I'm assuming you're probably a lot more familiar with that term than I am after being in the mission field for a long time. But do you, do you have anything that uh, you guys would recommend to us for, yeah. yeah. Um, Actually, Sharon had some good recommendations. She, yeah. well, she did a lot of just um, blog reading for that. Um, I haven't done as much reading, but uh, you know, we often talk. You know, she'll discuss what she's been reading and what she's been learning. So one is um, my book is Ruth Ellen and Rakin, uh, Letters Never Sent: A Global Nomad's Journey from Hurt to, to Healing. Um, and another one is um, Louis, Louis J. Bouchon. Mm-hmm. That's not right. Belonging everywhere and nowhere. Insights into counseling the globally mobile. Can you say that? Uh, uh, what everywhere and nowhere? Belonging everywhere and nowhere. Mm-hmm. Insights into counseling the globally mobile. I think I've seen actually these books in in the Bible College, or um, I recognize the cover of Letters Never Sent. She's back. I'm back for the moment. Just giving some. <laughs> no me. problem. Yeah, do you, uh, did you have any more than, uh, other than those two books, Letters Never Sent and Belonging Everywhere and Nowhere, uh, books that you might recommend to folks that are Specific on the field? for third culture kids? Yeah, yeah, or mission. Uh, we haven't really read much on the topic book-wise. Um, when I first started thinking about the topic was from reading about it in the blogosphere. Mm. That, I, but I, that was so many years ago, I can't remember what blogs were helpful, but that's, that's where I found a lot of helpful information. One of the questions I wanted to ask uh, is, do you think there are any special challenges that you guys face 
uh, that folks in their home culture might not uh, with raising kids in, in a in a second culture, creating your third culture, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and what could you share with, especially with parents that are thinking about bringing their kids onto the field, if that makes sense with them? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's the, just the kind of practical logistical problems of, you know, dealing with a medical system and how to get your kids adequate care when you're not used to that system because where you came from is different or a school system that has different standards, different expectations that you know nothing about. Um, but I think the biggest challenge is, um, well, did you explain about what third culture kids no. are? Okay, is that what you're talking about, the third culture kid dynamic. <laughs> and that is, if you're not familiar with it, is when you have parents from one culture who move to another culture and raise kids there. And so you've got two cultures going on, the parents' home culture and the culture of their you know, adopted country. But then the combination of these two can kind of, well, it's not so much the combination of two, but for the child growing up between those two cultures, the child develops their own third culture. That is neither the home culture nor the adopted culture. It's something different from both. And it results in the child not feeling at home anywhere because no one anywhere can really relate to them unless it's other kids who have also grown up in a similar sort of situation. And these other kids could have grown up anywhere in the world with parents from any country, but because of those dynamics, they can connect really easily and relate to one another really well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we found all of our kids were born after we moved overseas. So we mm -hmm. didn't have the um the difficulty of uprooting our kids from what they'd always known and taking them somewhere else mm -hmm. was, you know what would you say to parents who are thinking of going on the mission field with kids yeah. we did have a sort of miniature version of that when five years ago we moved from a, a small very sort of friendly city in western ukraine called ternopil we moved from there to kiev which is a very large city in central Ukraine, uh, different languages. In Chernobyl, everyone speaks Ukrainian. In Russian, uh, in Russian, in Kiev, most people, people speak Russian. Um, the cultures are extremely different. In Kiev, people tend to be very brusque, sometimes even, I don't know, almost mean, you know, because it's mm -hmm. a big city dynamic. Um, and our kids left behind, uh, they had a lot of friends in the church there. Uh, two of them, well, one of them was already enrolled in school. The other one had been going to kindergarten and was going to join his brother at this you know, school. Uh, they left behind cousins, uncles, aunts. And so it was a very traumatic move for them. And not quite as, I think, traumatic as moving, say, from the US to Ukraine or Mongolia or wherever you might go. But, but still, it was, it was very difficult. And um, one of them especially grieved, to this day, I think, is still grieving a little bit that loss. And one thing that I felt <laughs> I found to be extremely important was to um, <laughs> was to acknowledge that grief, mm. to be open about my own grief, um, to grieve with him, to give him the space to grieve. Kind of process that together. Yeah, yeah. because at, initially I was trying to kind of help him see the good things in the move and the mm -hmm. blessings God had give us, given us where we've moved and the new friends he was making. And always when he would talk about, oh, I miss this and that. And I would say, oh, but look at this and that. And um, I realized after a few months of that, that really I was minimizing his pain and he needed space to feel that pain and to work through it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, would be even more the case for parents moving from the US. And the thing is the missionary lifestyle and generally just the third culture kid lifestyle because third culture kids, often they're kids of diplomats or kids of missionaries or kids of um, like military personnel. So they tend to move around a lot. And mm -hmm. this constantly getting uprooted and having to go somewhere else creates a lot of grief in the, in the child's childhood. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to acknowledge that grief and try to help them work through it. Yeah. George, is there anything that you could add from your uh, 
I think it was your teenage experience, right? How old were you when you got when you guys uh, when your parents moved over to yeah, Ukraine, yeah. and and you know how was that for you? Mm-hmm. Not from a parenting side, but from a from a you know being one of the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was sixteen, and mm-hmm. it, was a, it was a difficult move for me um, because yeah, I'm, I, I yeah a lot of friends and. Um, you know, and it was somewhat sudden, you know, I had some, I had plans for my life. I was going to go to college and had this idea of what my life would look like mm-hmm. and to be suddenly, have that suddenly changed on me. Now, my, my dad, he asked us to pray about it and think about it. He didn't want to just force us into the situation, mm-hmm. especially the ones that could, you know, had made, consciously make a choice. The younger mm-hmm. ones. You know, was there an option to stay home? Well, I, um, I don't know what dad would have done. Um, but I mean, he did want to know, make sure that the older ones were on board with it. If we weren't on board with it, then he he probably would have reconsidered. Um, now he did say though, that we were going to make a year commitment and that we could, we could come back if we needed to. Um, also after, you know, I could come back, I think it was possible I could have come back for high school. Um, you know, so I mean, they, they tried to be flexible with that. Um, so... Now, again, it was, it's another story, but it was a great experience in the long run, but it was, it was pretty difficult. Like I kind of got depressed and, you know, just because I think culture shock and things like that. So mm-hmm. I think it's always good to kind of be aware of that in your children. And like Sharon said, be willing to kind of acknowledge the hardship and you know, not just try to put a happy face on it, but try to, try to acknowledge it as well and, and, and you know, agree with them. Mm-hmm. I guess another thing I would say just to add is um, she was talking about uh, it could be hard to um, identify or have, or even for people to understand those kind of children, right? Because mm-hmm. they, their their American friends can't understand them completely because they haven't been here. Ukrainians don't understand because they don't know what they've left. Even with our kids growing up here, I mean, there's there's a, there's a different culture in our home, right? It's not necessarily American either, but it's different. It's just kind of a mix. So, you know, it's again they're unique, um, and so that can kind of tend. It can lead to some kind of maybe feelings of loneliness. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the second thing I'd say that um, they can be targeted for bullying in school because they are different. We've had that experience, and my brothers and sisters have too. Not not me necessarily, but um, yeah, I think you have to be aware of that. Like, because kids tend to kind of pick on the ones who are different, and so that can happen as well. Maybe I, I would just say, you know, you want to keep. Um, yeah, conversation going with your kids knowing what's going on to help them kind of deal with those issues. Mm-hmm. That makes, that makes total sense. You said, uh, um, you said that your house isn't necessarily American and not Ukrainian and that kind of thing. Do you guys, uh, ever talk about between the two of you, how much you're trying to integrate Ukrainian culture into your, into your household? Because, just to give a little bit of background and, and where I'm coming from with this question, uh, my wife is Ukrainian. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we go through seasons, but right now uh, we are barely ever speaking English. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can find myself more strained at the end of the day when, when I'm speaking more Ukrainian than English because, it, you know, it kind of works your brain a little harder to speak a second language. Um, but for many years, for probably the first seven years of me being here, I tried to do everything Ukrainian, read everything Ukrainian, got a Ukrainian Bible, tried to do my devotions in it, that kind of thing. How, how much have you guys tried to do that? And is there a point where you can say it's more helpful than harmful or, you know, those kind of things? Like, does that all, uh, that big salad of a question, does that make sense? Helpful, like in uh, trying to become more Ukrainian or like becoming integrating more. Into- How much do you guys uh, integrate the outside culture into, um, home. into your home in a way that is, hey Sharon, uh, how do you guys, in- how much do you guys integrate uh, the outside culture in your home? How do you say that? Uh, intentionally. intentionally. Like, yeah. Hmm, I don't, I don't know if we do it intentionally, do we? Um, mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah, I think it's just, I mean, it just kind of bleeds into it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The kids are, that's you know, fine. Are, you know, they're, 
I mean, they've grown up here. So, I mean, it's going to be part of the, how they well, interact. So. The thing is, did you tell them that we send our kids to public school? Oh, yeah, we haven't done that yet. We, yeah, mm -hmm. so we, we don't have to intentionally integrate the outside culture in because we're sending them to public school. Mm. So they're getting immersed in the culture every day and the language. Mm. And so we feel like our home, people often ask us, they criticize us, you should be speaking Ukrainian with your kids at home. Why aren't you speaking Ukrainian? I'm thinking, first of all, if I spoke Ukrainian to them, I'd teach them bad grammatical habits. So that's not an ideal. Um, yeah. <laughs> they speak Ukrainian better than I do at this point. And, and secondly, well, maybe actually in my mind, first and foremost, is we want them to be able to speak English also. <laughs> And so if we spoke Ukrainian at home, where would they learn English? Yeah. And, um, and so we make, you know, home, the language of the home is Ukrainian, uh, sorry, English. And I also speak French with the little guys. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get Ukrainian and Russian at school. And it, it's, you know, it works pretty well. And as far as I know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not professional linguists or anything, but um, from what I've heard is that it's best for you to speak one language with your child. You know, so now we're speaking, I speak English to them. Actually, and there's another story, but Sharon, with the three youngest, have been speaking, she's been speaking French. I speak, I try to speak entirely in French to the yeah. three youngest ones. Mm -hmm. And the oldest ones hear it all the time. So the two of our eldest have um, started to take French in school at this point because they're old enough to add a second foreign language. And they're nice. very well because of the French exposure they've had for the last seven years. Yeah. So you're cool. confusing if you kind of try to two or three languages at one time from one person. So they, they know I'm going to be speaking English and that's helps the child kind of receive that. And adapt I find it. that helps in my adult life. Actually, there are certain people that, you know, are trilingual and I can understand all three languages, but we speak this language with that person, you know, that kind of thing. So like, yeah. and it just helps me to sort those things in my mind yeah. even. So that makes total sense. So you guys, the way you guys handle language learning is basically at school, they learn, uh, uh, Russian and Ukrainian and um, here uh, when you're when they're at home uh, English and French right so have you guys done anything else uh, to like before you sent them to school were they taking uh, Ukrainian lessons in some way or something like that like how did you guys get get them to a proficiency level uh, to where they were speaking Ukrainian uh, well enough to go to first grade yeah, well the first three kids attended kindergarten before they went to first grade Mm -hmm. So that, that helped. Um, mm -hmm. Our fourth one, and also I think with our first two, we also got some private Ukrainian lessons at home from a friend, but that actually wasn't very helpful. They didn't, hmm. they just needed the immersion of kindergarten. And that was a much more natural way for a child to learn. And it was much more effective. Um, our fourth child never got the benefit of kindergarten because uh, we were, we just recently moved and um, I don't know, things were disorganized and I just had a baby and I guess he kind of fell between the cracks in a sense, which sounds really bad. But amazingly, I mean, kids of that age are so good at picking up languages and first grade isn't, it's not academic here. They're, they're teaching them academic things, but they don't actually give them grades. Mm -hmm. So it gives you this whole year of kind of like a grace period for the kid to learn the language. So that's what he did this year. And his teacher was really uptight. Like she was like, Oh, there's 29 kids in my, or 30 kids in my class and 29 of them can read really well. As in like, you know, what's wrong with your kid? I'm like, hello, <laughs> he's yeah. learning the language. He'll catch up, don't worry. Yeah, goodness. <laughs> that, but that's one of the challenges, I'd say. Because <laughs> you, you're gonna, they're gonna be at a disadvantage, maybe the beginning, they catch up, but, and then until teachers can get a little um, more experience, but they'll get a little uptight about it. Not really, not having that experience with the, uh, they're a culture kid, you know, and yeah. so they're, they're, they're worried. We're not worried. We're like, hey, this is the fourth one. We know it's worked so far. <laughs> so how did you guys uh, have that conversation, start that conversation between the two of yourselves of, okay, we're going to send our kids to um, public school here in Ukraine or uh, that kind of thing? Because the at least the experience I have with other missionaries here in Lviv and, and uh, Western Ukraine, um, uh, excluding John, uh, and, and Stephanie is I think most of my friends that are missionaries have homeschooled. I can think of four different missionary families in Western Ukraine that I know that, uh, that homeschool. So how did you guys arrive at that and what, uh, advantages and disadvantages did you guys take into account? Well, shall I answer that? I, mean, I think it's really interesting. Um, 
because there, there is that expectation that missionaries homeschool. I get that all the time when I'm talking with other Americans. Oh, so do you homeschool your kids? As in, yeah, I know you do. I'm just asking to make small talk. Like, Actually, <laughs> being public school. And then the draw drops and they don't know what to say next. Yeah. Right, so. But really for me, I, I don't think I ever considered homeschooling because George's parents had made the wise decision to integrate their kids into the local schools when they moved here. And a lot of it was, I think, to learn the language, right? Mm -hmm. And I'd seen firsthand how effective it was, how they were all so beautifully bilingual or trilingual in you know, some of their cases, George is trilingual. Um, and it just didn't make sense to me. Why would we homeschool when we've got this perfect opportunity for our kids to really pick up on the language? And it has the added benefit, not just linguistically, but culturally, they learn the culture. It's the closest thing we can get to helping them understand what it's like to be Ukrainian. And, but beyond that, in a ministry sense, because it can be difficult when you're in full-time ministry to cultivate friendships with non-believers, because where are you going to meet non-believers, right? Because you're yeah. always involved with your ministry team and doing churchy stuff. And if you've got your kids in public school, you can't help but rub elbows with non-believers all the time. And so it's a great opportunity to build relationships with non-believers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, I think there's, of course, you need to be flexible. And we don't, we're not saying that that's the only way. Uh, we just found there's a lot of advantages. And um, I mean, my parents too, they weren't, um, they, were, they put us in public school at the beginning, but then I think- Some of you Some of you, did yeah, some of them did, did homeschool because it was just, you know, they were, uh, for different reasons, maybe somewhere they were, they were older, and so just that transition was really difficult. So they ended up doing homeschool. Um, and it actually, but one of one of my brothers ended up go, actually when we interviewed David, um, ended up going back and going to high school in, in the states, and that's a whole other story. But I think they were they were also flexible; they weren't just rigid in this approach. Mm -hmm. And one of our kids not long ago was asking, saying, "I want to be homeschooled, mommy," because some of his cousins have been homeschooled, and I was like. Okay, now why? I was trying to get to the bottom of like, is, is, he, is he being bullied at school? Does yeah, he feel yeah. like he doesn't fit in? Um, you know, what, what was it? And I think what it was actually was he thought that if he was homeschooled, he would have a whole lot more free time. <laughs> ah, and this, you know, 14. coronavirus quarantine happened and he essentially became homeschooled for three months <laughs> and found out that actually homeschool is a lot of hard work. He was like, actually, mommy, I don't want to be homeschooled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, for reality. Like said, we're open to that if it ever seems like that would be the best option for any one of our kids in the future, mm -hmm. because we've already got the language down. So to me, it's not mm -hmm. that big of an issue now where they get schooled, since they've already, you know, once they've got the, the our oldest three are are very fluent in the language now. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking about this uh, quarantine too, it, because of the homeschool experience. There was one of our children, the second one that. We found out that we need to be more involved in this education. We we kind of it kind of um, just let the public school handle him. And there's some things that weren't happening. You know, he's missing out on some things. So it kind of forced us to be more hands on. So I think yeah, that's yeah. That was helpful. It was helpful. It was a yeah, advantage in that homeschool experience for us. Well, praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, shifting gears a little bit. Uh, if that's all right. Uh, one of the things that a couple of missionaries have told me, um, married couples, you know, uh, I've heard this several times actually, um, is that uh, one of them can be more stuck at home with the kids and the other one is more out in the world uh, in ministry, that kind of thing. And uh, I've even known uh, local Ukrainians, uh, married couples, we've talked about uh, that kind of thing. So I was wondering if, if you guys have uh, experienced that dynamic, if you guys, uh, uh, you know, have dealt with that and how have you, what encouragement could you give um, to younger couples that are, that are thinking about going on the mission field or that are, that are still don't have kids and might experience that, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, start with it. Uh, couples are different and dynamics can be different. So we'll share our experience and we'll try, but we'll also try to make some, make hopefully helpful um, generalizations. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm generally an out, I'm generally the extrovert. I am the extrovert. She's the introvert. So it has I'm worked a major out. Major well. introvert. Major introvert. Yeah. So it worked out well for me in the world. You know, that's how it's worked out. 
You prefer to be at home. I, I yeah. like having the excuse of lots of kids to stay home a lot of times. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That would be totally different if the wife is more the extrovert. We know of those kind of couples, you know. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I, uh, yeah, it has been important, though, to make sure, for me to make sure that my wife is getting out enough. <laughs> uh, because being at home, even if she's an introvert, you know, it's uh, not exactly healthy. I mean, you need that time to go out and see the world and, <laughs> um, have, you know, broaden your horizons. And so we've... Uh, and we, we came to a point in our relationship where that was that was a, it was an issue, and there was some. You know, I think maybe Sharon can share, share some more about that. Right? Some more a little bit of resentment, or I don't know, frustration. Is there? Maybe oh, yeah, I guess I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, just I I tend to be happy being at home, but mm -hmm. but uh, but I guess after it was after one of the one of the last two kids was born, and we were in the states. And I started processing some things. It had been a really hard term on the field, I think two, two years. Um, they'd been really emotionally draining for us. We'd uh, been in a ministry situation that was difficult. Georgia had a lot of health issues and we'd made diet changes. And of course, I bore the brunt of the diet change stress because I'm the one who prepares the food. And just it, it had been a very difficult time. And I had been pretty much, pretty much a shut-in for that period of time. And because uh, we lived out in a village, and so it was hard to even get out. I mean, I could walk yeah. the mud streets in the village, but that was about it, you know? And uh, just difficult to get, and we lived right outside of Kiev, but it was difficult to get into Kiev without, you know, a vehicle, which George usually had the vehicle because he was going into Kiev every day. And so I was stuck at home with the kids, a kilometer walk from the bus stop. And, you know, it was just, and, and I started um, emotionally, I was really just kind of struggling and realized that I, I do need to get out more. And so we've tried to, as much as I like to stay home and I'll make all these justifications for why I'm fine at home, I don't really need to go anywhere. But over the process of, of months and years, it can, it can um, just create an unhealthy emotional landscape. Mm -hmm. And so we try now, now it's a lot easier. We live in downtown Kiev. All I have to do is step out our door and I can walk five minutes in any direction and be someplace cool, you know? <laughs> and. Um, and so we try to take advantage of that. We're still working on developing a good system, but where George will stay with the kids, you know, like one morning or one afternoon a week and I'll go out, I'm a writer. And uh, so I'll go out to some cafe and I'll, you know, write a blog post or write a letter to someone or something like that. And it, for me, that's very nourishing emotionally. And because we um, live downtown, I can be more involved in ministry things. We're trying to plant a church in the neighborhood where we live and our apartment, is actually it's part of a it's one side of a duplex and the church office mm. is the other half of the duplex actually we're sitting in the church office right now awesome. and with the ease at which the kids are coming through you can see that we yeah. really <laughs> um, and so it's given me the opportunity to be a lot more involved in ministry mm. things um which has been very nice actually i've been enjoying it mm -hmm. that's um, great yeah and i would say also just um it's good to have that conversation too, just with your spouse. Yeah. Like what, every once in a while, it's kind of uh, assess things like, how, you know, uh, are you happy? And, or are there certain dreams, you know, that um, well, you're wanting to accomplish, you know, wanting to, you know, can I help you with that? We're kind of talking with my wife. I think some things that we talked to me about were her aspiration is to write a book. You know, we haven't got there yet, but um, part of this, part of the steps is, is writing more blog posts, you know, and then well, that will turn into some more, something else. And she can have some time to think about a book and, um, even little things like playing, she loves playing violin and that really energizes her. I guess you could ask that question too, what, ener what gives you energy, what gets you going? And so, but, you know, so it's not like, because it can be, I think, this um, what do you call it? Um, false idea of how it should be, like, you know, the husband has a vision, he you know, does the ministry and the wife just, you know, has his back and so it enables him to do it. But, um, Again, each, each couple is different, but I would say that, you know, you'd be really, you know, that we're a team mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe a part of maybe her main role will be being home and taking care of the kids, at least in the season of life. But I think you need to kind of feel that out too. Like maybe that's not <laughs> the way it should be. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not wrong for the man to stay home for, you know, certain period of time so the wife can be doing ministry or doing other things. 
Um, you know, that so kind of thing, uh, I'm thinking about like, uh, as you're talking, some other conversations that you and I have had in the past about marriage and that kind of thing. And one of the things that I've learned from you in particular is uh, that at least um, like planning and intentionality are okay in a marriage, I guess, if that, if that makes any sense. Like not everything has to be spontaneous uh, to be romantic or not everything has to be spontaneous to be taking care of the other person, if that makes sense. Could you guys touch on that a little bit and like what that, what that looks like? Because I, that's, I remember that's something that you, that you and I have talked about in the past. It's, it's interesting because I've, I am a very, very spontaneous person, but <laughs> not the greatest spontaneous. Uh, but yeah, I guess. You know, you know, well, I, I would say when you were saying that, I kind of laughed and looked at George. I said, okay, they're essential. Um, <laughs> Because, especially when, when, if you don't have kids, sure, be spontaneous and just rely on that. I, I think that can work. And unless you've got like a really packed ministry and professional schedule. But so we were pretty spontaneous before we had kids. Mm -hmm. But once we had kids, we realized that had to change because if you try to be spontaneous with kids, it, it just doesn't happen. There's no room for spontaneity. There's too many obstacles in the way of couple time mm -hmm. it just yeah i mean sometimes it have, can can work but as a general rule you just you can't be spontaneous once you have kids maybe when they're older we're just barely starting to get to the threshold of that where we've got older kids who can conceivably babysit for us and we could maybe spontaneously decide to go out you know to a restaurant nearby or something but you know you've you've got to plan and and prioritize your marriage in order for it to thrive once you get to that stage where you've got so many other demands coming at you that seem so urgent. And it, it's, it's hard to prioritize, we're gonna spend time together when you've got all these kids who legitimately need your attention. Mm -hmm. You have to plan for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even, yeah, even, I mean, you're talking to couples, right? So married couples, so your intimate life too, it, it's, Kind of need to plan that as well. You know, I mean, there's, there's room for spontaneity, but uh, kind of need to plan that as well. It kind of sounds maybe, I don't know, not as romantic, but it's it does help. And you become more and more that way in, in our marriage. Praise the Lord. Wait. Thank you for touching on that. You know, I think that's something that we don't talk about enough as, as churches often. So. And yeah. this is one thing too that just came to mind. One thing that I think has drawn us closer as a couple since we had kids is approaching all of these challenges to our closeness as a unit, as a team, problem solving together. Um, in fact, I once wrote a blog post. It, it was the title was "Solidarity is the New Intimacy." Oh, because nice! I, I found that as we approach these challenges together, we grew closer. So instead of allowing the the stressors of little kids and sleep deprivation and you know baby schedules and whatnot to push us apart we together were trying to figure out okay how can we as a team deal with this and you know we found our ways that worked for us and and it just it drew us closer mm. awesome i like that i'm going to use that in the description i think so um can you send me a link to your to your blog uh while we're yeah when we get done here, I want to make sure that that's in there so that people can can read that. Um, you said something about writing a book. Uh, are you in the process of that? <laughs> no, just dreaming at this point. Um, yeah, what I would like if if it ever comes to fruition, the the book that I have in mind would be about people. Often, I come across people that have this false perception of missionaries. When mm. we're back in the states and visiting churches, and it's like I'm some saintly like a combination between a cross between like a saint and a celebrity. And I understand because I used to view missionaries the same way. I was this starry eyed, you know, wannabe missionary. And I just, I, I could hardly even speak when I got around missionaries because I was so tongue tied because I was in the presence of a missionary. Woo! And, um, <laughs> and, and now living that life, I just see how, you know, we're just normal, extremely broken, needy, weak people. And Jesus is the one that carries us through. And so I want to mm. write a book that, shows it from the two sides that opens up with this kind of false, you know, viewpoint that a lot of people have. And then through sharing experiences from my own life on the field makes Jesus the star of the story. 
That'd be wonderful. I, I've even noticed there's like a trend, uh, like there were, there's a, uh, a Facebook page that I saw a couple of posts from where there's uh, a woman who's a missionary and I think she's a single mother and she's got tattoos and she like cusses in her posts. And so I'm assuming you're not going to go that direction, but I do think this is something that needs to be talked about, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, going back to parenting, um, you know, being on, honest about my own heart, about my own fears, uh, this is something that uh, Katya and I have talked about a lot. It's, it's such a huge responsibility to be a parent. And honestly, there's a part of my heart that is still fearful of mm -hmm. becoming you know, a parent and bringing children into the world and raising them well and that kind of thing. I think some of that could be because of my parents' divorce and, uh, you know, all the drama surrounding with that and kind of the old, old wounds from that. But is there, can you guys encourage me personally, if that makes sense of, you know, if there's anybody else that also that's uh, discouraged as to maybe how dark the world is getting, um, you know, is it still worth it to be a parent, if that makes sense? So, yeah. I mean, I guess I'll start, I, this will be kind of a minor point, but it, it is kind of interesting that we have that kind of question because um, nowadays, we, it, what is it, you know, we, we, there is contraception now, you know, what didn't exist for most of history. So we, we didn't even have this conversation in the past. It'd be more like, is it worth it to get married? Because getting married, entails having kids you know, it's just yeah, and, and the disciples had that conversation with jesus i think right so that, that, yeah right, right. Yeah. so i guess that'd be tied to that kind of conversation but yeah since we live in this kind of time where we can it, i don't know for me it's, I mean, sometimes it even complicates it. it's like man if i could just not have to worry about that just trust god which we've done for part of our marriage um but i guess maybe for me i guess the comfort is that well god created it that way you know, that's kind of how God created marriage. So, you know, it's, it's something that design, in the design of marriage, which means that he's going to help us in that. And I hope that it makes, makes sense, right? Can we just hope? But I think Sharon also has something to add to that. Yeah, well, I can relate to those fears because before we had kids, um, I, I kept thinking, oh, we're not ready yet. That's such a huge responsibility. And... Um, uh, but then I realized at some point, you know, we're never going to feel ready. Mm -hmm. It's too big of a responsibility. If you feel ready, then you're maybe not understanding the gravity of the responsibility that, that kids bring, you know, and that it wasn't about us being ready. It was about God working in us, through us, strengthening us. Um, and it's interesting because kids, you know, people always say that marriage will make you grow, that will re reveal your faults and, you know, begin a, a process of purification and holiness, which is true. But in my experience, becoming a mother was far more mm. powerful than getting married in that regard. Um, I thought I was a patient person. And I thought I was just so kind and sweet until I became a mother and had these you know, children with their 24 seven demands, which are usually not made in a polite way, you know? And um, it's, it's really, it's been a huge challenge and a huge area for growth. Um, I'm getting off topic. So encouragement about the, the fears is just, it's, I, I think for me, it was not focusing on the fear so much as just taking it to God and focusing on him, knowing that, okay, if this is something that he's bringing into our life. He has a good purpose for it and he will be sufficient. And uh, I have struggled with fears. I, I tend to always imagine your worst case hypothetical situations and being missionaries. I think, well, what if we end up in a, a dangerous country? Yeah. What if evil people try to use our children against us to get us to deny Christ. I just, that, that thought horrifies me because children open you up to vulnerability in a way that nothing else can. Mm -hmm. and, and I've had to repeatedly over the years, just take those fears to the Lord and say, I trust you. I know that you are good. I know that you are loving. I know that you have us and our lives and the lives of our children in your hands and whatever you allow into our life, mm -hmm. I, I trust you. And I've just had to 
you know, bring those over and over again back to him. And I, I can't say that I've arrived at a place of never being anxious. If the, if the Lord were to call us to some dangerous place, I know I would struggle with those fears all over again. But at the end of the day, I know that he's good. I know that he loves us. Mm. And, and that, that has to be enough. Um, and if it's not, then I know that there's something in my heart that I need to get on my knees before him and address until that knowledge is enough. Amen. Idolatry, yeah. something that's that's um, more important, or or maybe something that um, give you great, gives you greater security than Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's some kind of yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say um, also just adding to that that um, um, really having kids. I mean, it brings you into a different world where you can have greater effect for Jesus because mm-hmm. um, you know now I. How do I meet neighbors? Well, a lot of times I'll, um, I'll, you know, go to the playground. I'll have kids, and then I'll start yeah. talking to a dad or a mom because oh, they have kids too, and so hey, you know, it just it was like, you know, if we didn't have kids, you know, you know, kids, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in that world. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so I mean, I'm just saying that there's there's things that I think that um, there's advantages to it, and yeah. Actually, that question we were talking about the challenges. Uh, I'd just add that there's advantages too. Uh huh. That makes sense. You don't have to think that you're going to become ineffective yeah. in ministry because oh, I have kids now or something like that, right? Yeah, right. Because that's, that was what um, my parents were told. Because they had, they had eight kids when they went to the mission field, and the youngest was six months. And we were going to what was the Soviet Union, you know, just to you know, put them down. And things were in disarray, and, and so there was people, you know, just. I, to this day, yeah. when, when Ukrainians find out the year that his parents moved to Ukraine with eight kids, their eyes get big. They're like, those were the most difficult years in my memory. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so, of course, Americans, you know, I think a lot of our culture often is about safety mm-hmm. and planning. It's like, are you sure you want to do this? I mean, is, is it safe? You know, what about the educational system? What about the, you know? the medical system and so on and so forth. And, um, and it, was, it was hard for them. I mean, they were, because, you know, they, they wanted to love their kids and do the best for them. There is also sacrifices to be made. And so, you know, having that, trying to figure out where they mm. can find. Well, my, my, my mom's dad, um, who was, had, um, he and his wife were long-term missionaries. They'd been in, they were pioneer missionaries in Zimbabwe, Africa. She was talking to him, and he gave some, I think, some wise words um, to her. And she, he said, "What people think is your greatest liability in having children would turn out to be your greatest asset." Mm. It was prophetic because that's actually what happened. We moved to Ukraine, we moved into a neighborhood, and began, you know, church planning. And probably the greatest, most effective evangelism was us kids because we had, we kind of had covered the whole range of ages. And we weren't, you know, it wasn't intentional. It was just, we would go out and make friends. And, and of course, we were really quick language learners children, so, and cultural learners. So we would just make friends and like, and they want to, you know, they want to hang out with us. And if we were going to some church functions, and hey, can we go with you? Sure. Why not? So they were, they were getting exposed to the church and kind of this gradual discipleship process. And many of them stayed, you know, and they became Christians. And then their parents became, you know, so it's, it was kind of this net that was thrown out. Yeah. So it, we did. We were an asset, you know. Um, and I'm, and I'm, as I'm, we're, we're uh, just have made the shift, and I think this will be maybe a later podcast. But we're doing more church planning, neighborhood church planning, which I believe strongly in. And one, one reason is because my whole family can be involved in it. I'm just mm-hmm. not, it's not taking me somewhere else. I'm right here. I'm, and the greatest thing we can do is to build relationships, right? Well, I have kids, so you know, we stand out. We have six boys. And, and people know it, and a lot of people now know about us. It's like, oh, that's the crazy American family with six boys, you know. Um, you know, and so they gotta find out, you know. So, I mean, there's, there's, we can use that to our advantage. And, um, and, and then my family's involved. You know, I'm part, I'm, I'm spending time with them and spending time with the community. It's more organic. My wife's involved, you know, where she can be. So, I don't know, that's, hopefully that helps too, just to, you know, kids are, are good, you know. Yeah. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. Can you guys talk a little bit more about the uh, 
kind of logistical, practical, okay, there, uh, there's a new couple on the mission field, or oh goodness, we're pregnant now type thing. Uh, is it worth it to, uh, to travel back to the States and you know, find uh, an American midwife or a doctor or go to the hospital there? Uh, did you guys stay here in Ukraine for all of your births or, or those kind of things? Like, uh, let's talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a very, very personal question mm -hmm. for, you know, each, each couple. Um, and part of it depends on the mom's medical history. Some women are, you know, are, have at-risk pregnancies just because of pre-existing health conditions. And I mean, I, I know of at least one mother where the Ukrainian doctors told her, we will not touch you. You need to go back to your home country. Wow. And, you know, things like that, because they didn't want to have the liability if she, you know, died of mm -hmm. having caused the death of a foreigner and things like that. So it's, I wouldn't say there's any one size fits all answer. I mean, we ourselves have had births three different ways with our six kids. Oh boy, come here. Can you see? Can you see? Can you see? Yeah. What do you want to do with them and all? Sorry. <laughs> um, so we had our our first child uh, in a government hospital here in Kiev. Mm -hmm. um, that actually ended up being a really bad experience for us. Mm -hmm. uh, a combination of of uh, hospital personnel who just they didn't work well together and they weren't really interested in what we wanted, things like that. And so it, we didn't actually have any more Ukrainian hospital births after that. Although I know a number of people who have had Ukrainian hospital births and have been very happy with it. So I'm not saying that that you know, isn't an option, but for us, we just didn't consider it because we'd been really kind of scarred by that first experience. But mm -hmm. we did go on to have two more children in Ukraine after that. Our second child we had in the US at a hospital um, with a, a, a wonderful Christian midwife who actually has a lot of missionaries that, that are her patients and will come back and uh, use her throughout, you know, all their pregnancies. But um, mm -hmm. had two more children in Ukraine, and for that, for them, we opted for home births um, with a uh, a Ukrainian midwife who, you know, tr does home births. Although for how does that work? For the second one, um, she actually was unable to make it because uh, she was hospitalized herself. Oh, and goodness. So it was a friend of ours who was a final year medical school student came and caught the baby for us. She'd been interning with an OBGYN on, during the summers for wow. some years. So, um, so that was interesting. But, um, and then, you know, the other, the other three, like I said, we, ha we had with that same midwife in the United States. And um, I just feel like the Lord led us with each birth, what we needed to be doing, because we never felt like we had to go back to the United States for every birth because there is the drawback. So we have health coverage in the U S so we don't have to pay for the births. Whereas in Ukraine, we have to pay out of pocket for whatever the expenses are, but the expenses in Ukraine are, uh, we paid less than a thousand dollars for each of our Ukrainian, you know, births. Oh yeah. That's um, dirt cheap. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, if you wanted to go to a fancy private clinic here in Kiev, you'd probably pay, I'm not even sure, $5,000 or more, but but uh, with you know the options we chose, it was cheaper. But but the the thing is, the tickets to get back to the United States are pretty expensive. So even though the health cover the health coverage is is free for us, it costs us several thousand dollars just to get the whole family back to the states. So mm -hmm. you know it's kind of and we have we personally we have children so frequently it's not practical to go back to the states every time we have a baby, and <laughs> and, and just ministry wise, it's not always practical because then you're off the field for. You know, for us, we, we do a pretty quick turnaround. Even when we're having a baby, we're usually only gone for like two to three months. But, you know, most people are not quite that, I don't know, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and so they'll Prolific take, so, or, or what, what's that called? Like, yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll take six months to a year to go yeah. back to uh -huh. have a baby, which, um, you know, for us, it, it just would have been really hard because George has always been involved in a senior pastor. Well, not always, but for most of our marriage, he's been a senior pastor. The senior mm -hmm. pastor can't just disappear for half a year to a year, you know? Yeah. Um, so so that, that's one aspect, too, is when we go back to the States for the baby, I love our midwife and our hospital there, but, but it's not a restful time. We're traveling around speaking at churches the whole time we're there. And that's not exactly what you want to be doing when you're, you know, eight, nine months pregnant, when you have a newborn. Um, oh, goodness, yeah. Um, 
So there, there, and there's actually a benefit to staying here because then you can relate more to the people you're ministering to. So when I talk to other mothers who have had births in Ukrainian hospitals and have had bad experiences, I can, I can be very empathetic. I know where they're coming from, you know, and, and it doesn't put us in a separate category like, oh, well, you always just, you know, escape to the States to have your babies and, you know, and you don't know what it's like for, you know, and so I, I really think it's a very personal decision that you just have to let the Lord lead you on. He led mm-hmm. us back to the States for the birth of our fifth child. And it turned out that he needed intensive care oh, goodness. Um, after birth. And he spent a week in the, in the newborn ICU mm-hmm. um, in Indiana. And I was so grateful that we were there because who knows if he would have made it if he'd been in Ukraine. Yeah. And, uh, and the Lord, you know, knew that we were going to need that. I, I'm fully convinced. And he used other, uh, other factors to influence us to go back to the United States for that birth. But in hindsight, I realized that probably the main reason why he pushed us to go back was so that he would, our son would get the care he needed. Wow. That's amazing. For your kids that were born in Ukraine, uh, were there any uh, like weird legal things with citizenship and that kind of stuff that you guys had to hoops that you guys had to Um, jump through? No. no. Um, as far as getting citizenship, that's pretty straightforward. If, if uh, at least one of the parents is an American citizen who has spent sufficient time in the United States. If, if only one of the parents is an American citizen and they grew up overseas, for example, you can, there, there can be some question of whether or not citizenship will be granted. And if both parents grew up overseas and they're both citizens, but neither of them has spent much time in the US, again, that, that can be questionable. Um, but if at least one parent is an American citizen who, you know, grew up in the States, there's no trouble whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The only trouble we experienced was actually getting the birth certificate for our first son. It took us nine months, but that had nothing to do with us being, well, it did sort of have something to do with us Americans. The lady at the office that grants Ukrainian birth certificates just didn't like us because we were foreigners and was refusing to give it to us. And we actually had to move to another city and get registered in that city to go to a different office to get a birth certificate. It was how. Wow. It but uh, but from the you know the normal legal side, there shouldn't have been any trouble. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's one issue with James, though, he was born in it was a home birth, like we did. did you talk about home birth. Yeah. Oh, okay. The one, I mean, that, that was there. There are some legalities that in. Um, determining that the child is yours because it wasn't a hospital. So, you know, we, for, you know, we have one in, at home, but then we needed to go to the hospital and spend some time there so that they would give us a birth certificate. But that's kind of a different mm-hmm. matter. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess my last question is how can we pray for you guys? And uh, yeah, then we'll wrap it up. So how can we pray for you, your family, your church, you know, the church plant and, and uh, also anything personally. So, yeah um here we go oh we got the kids here so (laughs) yeah um yeah it's a think um yeah for our church plant we're just kind of starting out um just recently made the transition with uh, the church we've been part of you know coverage up kiev so um the national now is pastor again dima and uh, so we can kind of be more involved with uh, and churches and uh and not just planning one church but we really see ourselves as part of helping in a movement of church planning especially in kiev and there's we see that kind of growing which is exciting but again and i'll probably know the podcast but just yeah um pray for that <laughs> um i'm just generally for wisdom to you know, raise the kids to disciple them. And mm-hmm. yeah, um, I really, I didn't touch yeah. on this when we were talking, but I really see that as my primary, stop, as my, my primary uh, ministry is to my kids. And so I think that's why I don't chafe under being home at to- home with them all the time, because I, I just feel so strongly that what I'm doing with them is immensely valuable. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. but I need wisdom yeah. for it definitely that's yeah. actually uh, that was something I forgot to ask you guys about is um, how do you guys uh, handle the spiritual side of raising mm-hmm. your raising your children do you guys have family devotions you know I'm sh- I know you guys take your kids to church mm-hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, 
you know that 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 kind of thing. What what would you guys recommend for for that side of? Well, the yeah. kids are young. Um, can't say we've been perfect at this. I mean, we, we um, actually it's been a little while since we did it. we have the devotions together. Uh, but okay, my goal is to read to do some Bible reading with them once a day, at some point. Uh, we, we've um, we try to make it fun, like we had like, some special dessert and drink together. And I, and I would just read from, in, using like a paraphrased version of the Bible, just reading it. Cool. And then questions would come up and we would talk about it. Especially when you're, oh, yeah, had some interesting discussions from the Old Testament a while, you know. And, <laughs> uh, and you talk about some sexual issues and, you know, this, good stuff. So I don't guess, I guess um, realizing it's important, you know, and trying to get it in there. Um, I think, and I think the most important thing is our example, personally. Mm. So, like the kids, uh, some of the older kids have started to read their Bibles daily because they just see that, you know, George and I do that. Mm. And actually, I, it's changed my approach to my daily quiet time because, you, know, you know, people always say, oh, you need to do it first. <laughs> you need to do it first thing in the morning. <laughs> Before your kids wake up, so there's no distractions and everything. And I, I love that idea. But yeah. um, in the last, you know, 13 years, I've almost always been either pregnant or had a nursing baby who was getting me up in the middle of the night. So I was often too tired to wake up the extra hour before my kids, because little kids tend to wake up early anyway. And, uh, and so I was just, you know, grabbing my quiet time whenever an open spot came during the day, during someone's nap time, or just whenever it would open up. And but I realized there's a huge advantage to that because mm. when I would get up early and do it before the kids got up, they would never see me reading my Bible. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, they see mom reading your Bible and, you know, I, they all know that, oh, this has got mommy's time with God and we, we leave her alone because God's speaking to her. And, you know, and it, and it's, so it's just made it a very natural thing. They grow up with this knowledge yeah. of, wow, we read the mm. Bible and God speaks to us. And, yeah. and so, you know, uh, yeah. and then they want to emulate that, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something uh, like that's also really important in this day of this like age of uh, computers and gadgets and that kind of thing. That one of the things that one, a pastor I know, a local pastor guy that I know uh, has talked about mm -hmm. is he'll do his devotions on his computer. And uh, one time somebody asked, it was like one of the kids asked another one of the kids, what's dad doing right now? Is he busy? And he said, oh, yeah, he's just playing games on the computer. So don't bother him. He's, you know, he's playing games on the computer yeah. and he was doing his devotions and then also like transitioning into sermon prep, uh -huh. you know, but he's, you know, there on the couch laid back, you know, doing something, you know, like, and it, they don't know the difference. And so I think it's important for, I mean, like to have one of these, <laughs> you know, not do everything online. And, uh, and I think there's a reason, like, uh, in the Old Testament where God commanded the Israelites to, you know, have the, the scripture on the doorway and to, to have the phylacteries and, and uh, the, the tassels and everything, that there were visual, visual representations of their faith, right? Uh -huh. uh, that I think sometimes we shy away, with, uh, away from because of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, you know, go pray in your closet. But he, he was talking about something, I think, pretty specific. You know, it, so it's, I don't think it's like taking away from the example that we have to set for, yeah. for our yeah. kids or the people around us or that kind of thing. So, sorry, that's my soapbox. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say, I mean, it's a different, some a different subject, but maybe I'll do a podcast on this, but technology and children, because that also affects, you know, relates to their spirituality, you know, so we, we you know, we want to. Uh, that's different, like a different subject but that's been part of our discipleship is trying to is trying to navigate that okay so, um, you know we're, what's limits to set but then you know what freedom to give them and that's a whole other wax but um, yeah cool that, i mean that's very important so yeah yeah, yeah. we could be about we could yeah. recommend on that i don't know if you want that but yeah yeah uh, it's, called, it's called the tech wise family t-e-c-h dash wise by uh i think his name is andy crouch is yeah c-r-o-u-c-h i believe you could mm -hmm. uh google it to make sure i've got that yeah i'll look it up 
Yeah, Andy Crouch. Yeah, got it. I will put that in the description beneath then, the video. Let's do how, we're gonna, how we do our devotions, and he talks about that as well. Like, kind of, kind of integrate that. And um, yeah. it was funny. We just uh, yesterday, uh, or no, I don't forget when it was, but you know, a few days ago, uh, a lady came over, and he's just a lady we met through an English club here in the community. Not a believer, as far as I know, but she's become a friend. And she, she came over and the kids were showing her around the house and our uh, seven-year-old took her in the kitchen and said, and this is the chair that mommy sits on to read her Bible. <laughs> and when she's reading her Bible, she usually drinks a cup of tea. And <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I thought, okay, they're noticing. They're <laughs> well, you can bet they are. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So um, praying for... Uh, Dima, the senior pastor, and uh, now in the other church, uh, you guys church plant wisdom for raising uh, your kids and discipleship. Is there is there anything else that you guys would like us to pray for? Yeah, I think you pray. We you know, we've um, in the past few years too have seen much you know a need for rest <laughs> and, mm. and finding that being intentional. Yeah. So we've been working on. On that, just to making it so it's restful. Because even yesterday we had our we have our day of rest on Mondays. Mm -hmm. It was a little you know, just because you know, he, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe um, trying to figure out planning not planning it enough so that it's restful instead of just kind of oh, whatever happens. Mm -hmm. Again, with having kids, you can't just always do that. You need to. What are you going to do that's going to energize you? Again, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and we're Keep learning. Ready. So we're going to have a maid. You can pray for it there. Yeah, I think that's something that we need to be wary of, especially coming out of this time of crisis with COVID and everything. Especially people at home uh, that are that are dealing with like the riots and everything. There's so much stress, and I think there there's quite a few of us that will need to take uh, some time to decompress. Uh, you know, and I think uh, I've I heard uh, a couple of talks about stuff that happened after. Um, uh, 9 11, you know, that, be, that people two years after the fact were still like, you know, yeah. dealing three years after the fact, still kind of feeling the stress yeah. level elevated. And so, yeah, I think we rest is certainly something that's very relevant right now for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All righty, can I pray for you guys right now? <laughs> Good deal. Let's, uh, let's pray. God, thank you once again so much for the Markies, for all of them, not just our friends in Kiev, but uh, particularly for the, for these two and their kids. I do pray for uh, wisdom uh, in their raising the kids and discipling uh, the kids and for also caring for one another, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for the example that you have uh, for us in them. Uh, I do pray for them to be able to rest. God, that you would give them uh, the time and the resources to plan intentionally uh, regular times and also uh, maybe a, a good vacation coming out of this whole quarantine thing. Uh, thank you for Dima for being there at, the, at, at uh, CC Kiev and I pray that you bless him and his leadership in that church and I pray for this new church plant with George and, and Sharon there and and uh, I don't know who else is on their team but uh, God I pray that you would continue to to bring more and more people around them there and then also that this wouldn't be obviously uh the last one that they would be able to create more of a church planting movement uh, in ukraine and and help us all in in calvary chapel to uh support and to, to to jump onto that in jesus name we pray and thank you lord for them amen, amen. yeah well god bless you guys and uh thank you guys so much for for being on here thank you yeah thank you for having us it was a, it was a pleasure yeah.